Welcome back to another D&D Monsters Ranking. In this new installment, we'll be looking at humanoid creatures, of which there are many. Some of the most well-known and classic monsters are, in fact, humanoids, from orcs and goblins to kobolds and lizard folk. But there are many lesser-known humanoid creatures, and they are all worth considering. To be clear, what I'm reviewing in this ranking are the monsters that are in the bestiaries of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons that have the humanoid creature type. I'm not reviewing character race options from the player's handbook or other player supplements, nor am I reviewing NPCs. You're not going to see generalized NPCs like Bandit or Cult Fanatic, nor am I reviewing specific named NPCs from an adventure module. There are a ton of humanoid monsters throughout the 5e bestiaries, so there's no way I'm going to be able to include every single one of the entries, but I'm going to make a concerted effort to get a lot of them into this ranking. Lots of humanoids also have several different variants, so whenever possible, I'll include the base version, such as Orc, plus one of the best variants, such as Orc Red Fang of Shargoss. As always, I'm going to be looking at each creature's different attributes, mechanics, style, role-playing, lore, and versatility. In other words, I'm concerned about the whole picture. How interesting are its abilities? How effective are the aesthetics? How much does it engage and interact with the characters? How interesting and inspiring are its stories and its ecology? How much can it fill different roles and pursue different goals and not just be a one-trick pony? And as we go along, I'll be ranking each creature, lowest to highest, F tier through S tier. There are a lot of really cool humanoid monsters, so I'm pretty excited to jump in here. Just before I do, I want to say if you enjoy this kind of content, please subscribe and hit the like button. Your encouragement is like sending me a die of bardic inspiration. And while I love being the one who gives out the inspiration dice, it also really helps when others give it to me. So there you have it, and thank you. Now, let's break into the monster's lair and see what savage forces are mustering. What strange rites are being performed. The only humanoid monster in F tier is the Lokatha. It's not a Quotoa, not a Sawagan, not a merfolk, not a marrow. It's that other kind of fish person that is often forgotten. It really deserves some better abilities and better lore and a makeover to give it a unique and effective appearance. What we have here is meh, kind of a soggy potato. Its mechanics are incredibly simple, just has a basic spear attack, and it has advantage on saving throws against a few conditions. Oh, also it requires that it can't be out of water for more than four hours. Overall, it's a neutral aligned beast folk race that is minimal, mediocre, lacking in lore, lacking in role playing traction, and to top it off has this goofy, awkward appearance. So that's it, just the one creature in F tier, and it's at high F tier, but still it's just too disappointing to be in any other bin than back to the drawing board. It's in mid D tier that we find our next creature, the Tortle. I spoke about my criticisms and dislikes for this creature in my top 10 worst D&D monsters video, which essentially boil down to basic uninspiring lore, an aesthetic that comes off as cartoonish, and a pathetic shell defense ability that in most situations is worse than just taking the dodge action. I think turtle creatures can work, especially as giant turtle beasts or ancient turtle monstrosities or even turtle dragons. Yes, but a turtle humanoid, I don't know, just doesn't seem to come off as cool as, say, like a lizard man or a yawn tea. Next is the troglodyte. They are cave dwelling, simple minded humanoids with an extremely crude society. They're lazy, violent, stupid, and completely uncivilized. They dwell in filth and debris and have no higher ambitions. Really, troglodytes represent the most vulgar and rotten of humanoids. In combat, they attack with bites and claw strikes, and they give off a stench that can sicken non-troglodytes. Their skin can shift colors, helping them to hide and ambush, but otherwise they are not intelligent enough to craft strategies. Troglodytes worship Laugzed, a great demon that resembles a giant toad crossed with a lizard. He is a putrid creature whose only role seems to be that of a hunter or scavenger who constantly engorges himself. 
And that is it for D tier. So as it turns out, most humanoids are pretty good. So we're going to have a lot more to come in the other tiers. So getting into the low C tier, we have the Thrykreen, maybe Thrykreen. I'm not sure on the pronunciation there. This is an odd entry in that it's found in the monster manual instead of waiting to put it in a Dark Sun campaign setting book. If we ever get one in 5e, which I hope we do. These are insectile humanoids that wander deserts and savannas, hunting and killing to survive. They savor elven flesh in particular, though outside the Dark Sun setting, I don't imagine elves typically live near the scorching, arid regions that the Thrykreen inhabit. In combat, Thrykreen are skirmisher-type monsters. They can jump really well. They can change color like a chameleon. They have natural attacks in the form of claws and poisonous bites. They also craft unique pole arms and bladed boomerangs. Some Thrykreen also wield psionic spells like invisibility, blur, and mage hand. It's a decent humanoid monster, but it's really not reaching its full potential as just this single page in the monster manual. Darrow are underdark dwelling humanoids distantly related to dwarves. They are paranoid, twisted, chaotic evil things whose own mythology tells their race originated from an underground dwarf who betrayed his brother in order to steal magic power and escape some deadly foe, perhaps mind flayers, perhaps not. I appreciate the conflicting bits of lore, the disputes that arise from it varying from Darrow's to Duergar's to Dwarves. Individually, a Darrow is a weak creature. It wields a hooked spear and a light crossbow, though it does have magic resistance, which is somewhat similar to the Duergar's resistances to spells and other effects. A further nice touch is the Darrow Madness table, which provides 20 different madness quirks and flaws that a Darrow might have. Grimlocks are eyeless, underdark humanoids with a freaky appearance and savage nature. They have 30 feet of blind sight, but are otherwise blind. And in combat, they hide against stony terrain and attack with spiked bone clubs. Their origin is a disturbing read. Grimlocks were originally humans, but their worship of mind flayers and their practices of cannibalism caused them to warp and degenerate over time. The pre-Grimlock, human priests of old, were subverted by illithid mind control. In time, they changed from their original, true religion into the deification of the Mind Flayers, going so far as to regard Illithid's brain devouring as a sacrament. They would help the Mind Flayers abduct victims for this fell rite, and afterward, they received the brainless corpses as a reward. Grimlocks are fairly simple creatures, but their aesthetics and their race's story are certainly effective. Strangely, the Monster Manual only has a single entry for the Merfolk, and it's a very bare-bones CR 1 8 creature with only a simple basic attack and the ability to breathe both air and water. For as big as merfolk are in fantasy and popular culture, you would think that there would be more merfolk entries, especially if you consider that their lore states their kingdoms and tribes span the world over. And we get nice tidbits like how merfolk build their settlements in vast undersea caverns or mazes of coral or the ruins of sunken cities or just structures that they carve from the rocky seabed. It's strange to me, it just seems like such a waste. Grungs are another D&D monster for which I have long expressed my dislike. They do have some interesting mechanics with their high mobility of jumping and climbing, as well as their different natural poisons, but their bright and shiny, small-sized, cutesy things like something straight out of an animated movie for little children. They also have some decently good lore, with their society's caste system and the rituals and their slavery practices, which do set things up for a lot of storytelling. Imagine an adventure to free the captives enslaved by a faction of grungs, and the characters have to both fight in dynamic acrobatic skirmishes and navigate skillfully through the grung society, learning about their peculiar practices as they go along. The Darrow Savant is a leader type in the Darrow Society that wields magical power. It builds upon the baseline Darrow, adding essentially five levels of sorcerer. It's not completely five levels of sorcerer, as there aren't any other sorcerer features other than the spell casting. It does leave me wishing that it had at least one other thing, maybe some kind of wild magic feature. I think that would be really cool and fitting for the theme. It has a lot of evocation spells to deliver powerful blasts, as well as some classic spells like sleep, prestidigitation, invisibility, and spider climb. 
So the spells make this a more dynamic and bombastic kind of monster, but I do wish the spells would have played into the madness theme better. Sure, the maniacal sorcerer throwing around evocation blasts is a sort of arcane craze, and maybe the invisibility plays into the Darrow paranoia, but why not something like Crown of Madness or Fear? Quagoths are an underdark race of wild, furry savages. Long ago, they dwelt on the surface, living in trees, but they had many conflicts with elves that resulted in their defeat and near extinction. The surviving Quagoths fled underground, where over time, their fur became pale. They eventually allied with Drow, sharing the common enemy of surface elves. Dealing with Drow is usually a treacherous bargain. The Dark Elves came to rule and then breed these less intelligent Quagoth creatures, selectively mating them in order to enhance both their physical strength and their obedience. In combat, Quagoths are excellent climbers and they attack with twin claw strikes. They're especially dangerous when seriously wounded as they deal substantially more damage. They also see incredibly well in darkness and are immune to poison due to building up natural toxin resistances over many, many generations. Latent psionic magic infuses certain areas of the Underdark, and Quagoths are sometimes influenced by this, resulting in psionic shamans that the Quagoths refer to as Thonauts. Maybe Thonauts? I'm not sure on the pronunciation there. They can call upon magic such as Featherfall, Mage Hand, Cure Wounds, Enlarge slash Reduce, Heat Metal, and Mirror Image. Next we have the Bullywug. Whereas the Grungs are small-sized, brightly colored frog people, Bullywugs are medium-sized frog people with skin tones that are more suited to blending in with their surroundings. They're very good at jumping, they're amphibious, and they can speak with frogs and toads. Their combat abilities are limited to basic attacks, and they are slow on land but fast in the water. Bullywugs consider themselves to be the rulers of the swamps and organize themselves into castes and classes ranging all the way up to aristocracy and royalty, but their society is a corrupt, poorly executed mockery of what you would find among, say, humans or dwarves. Bullywugs have potential, but they're held back by their lack of interesting mechanics and an appearance that could come off as cheesy. Skulks are an interesting case of having a number of intriguing attributes, but almost nothing in terms of role-playing. They are humanoids who get lost in the shadow fell until that dreary plane saps them completely of their identity. Devoid of personality and self, a skulk becomes naturally invisible. It's almost like it doesn't even exist. It can be seen under certain circumstances, though. It casts a reflection in mirrors, appearing as a drab, smooth-featured humanoid can also be seen by humanoid children. And it can be seen while in the light cast by a tallow candle made from the rendered fat of a corpse whose identity is unknown. Other than the invisibility, a skulk has a single claw attack that deals a sort of sneak attack, but it's necrotic damage, and it cannot be harmed by radiant damage nor blinded. Skulks are known to attack and kill people, either at the bidding of a summoner who calls them or due to their own spontaneous urge to slay that which they once were. Sometimes, skulks carry out the tasks that their victims had previously performed, but all is done in a hollow, meaningless way. Imagine a silent village where invisible people go through the motions of upkeeping the settlement, but do so in flawed, incompetent ways without any emotion or personal connection. It's certainly eerie, but ultimately it is quite limited unless a DM goes in and customizes the skulk to be able to speak or to have some kind of personality or goal. Measles used to be humans, but they were transformed by dwelling in the Shadowfell, which exacerbated their bitter, resentful hearts and turned them into these twisted creatures that exist in places where the Shadowfell and the Material Plane meet, shadow crossings as they're usually known. Though the measles are not very versatile monsters, and they typically are not much for compelling dialogue or interactions, their mechanics are pretty damn cool. Their main tactic is to sneak up on someone, choke and grab them with a garrote, and then teleport themselves and the subjects through the shadows up to 500 feet. Upon arriving, the subject suffers a curse that alerts nearby undead and shadow creatures to its location. I quite like this monster. It's definitely one of my favorite C-tier creatures in this ranking. 
Shambling out of some strange and spooky old sea shanty is the Sea Spawn. They once were normal people, but were transformed by powerful aquatic beings and are now simple-minded monster folk encrusted with coral, barnacles, urchins, and the like. I really like the lore for the Sea Spawn. It makes a great connection between maritime fables and the foreboding, mysterious powers found in the ocean. Their abilities are nothing too splendid, just simple attacks and maybe some venomous spines or grasping tentacles. And the role-playing is quite limited due to their crude minds and their inability to speak. But their style and the inspiring lore that surrounds them really can make up for that. Moving into high C tier, we have the Fire Newts. They're amphibious humanoids that dwell in warm, wet areas such as hot springs or volcanic islands. They're immune to fire. They chew an alchemical admixture that allows them to spit fire at a range of 10 feet. And otherwise, they fight using metal weapons and armor. Nothing too amazing there. Their society is corrupt as they fervently worship Imix, who is an evil-aligned elder fire elemental. The Fire Newt Warrior and the Fire Newt Warlock of Imix are the only two entries we have for this race of humanoid, with the Warlock being more dynamic mechanically due to its fire spells and its cantrips. Overall, the Fire Newts have some interesting bits, but they aren't the most inspiring creature ever. The Coalinth is a kind of aquatic hobgoblin which we find in the Ghosts of Saltmarsh book. There is very little lore provided, so I'm not sure if we should go off the general hobgoblin lore or goblinoid lore in general, of which there is a great wealth, or if the Coalinth really should have their own lore. The book gives us two entries, Coalinth and Coalinth Sergeant. The base Coalinth really is just like a hobgoblin with a swim speed and water breathing, and it wields a trident instead of the normal hobgoblin weapon. The Coalinth Sergeant has much more interesting mechanics, including a hooked net and the ability to dart in and stab a creature that it has just netted. The Coalinth represents the most medium kind of creature imaginable. It's cool, but not so cool. It's developed somewhat, but not too developed. It's viable, but it's really not remarkable. Getting into the upper end of C tier, we have the Knoll. This is one of the most classic humanoid monsters of D&D, and it comes with a lot of lore and history in the game. We can find Knolls in the Monster Manual and Volo's Guide to Monsters. This entry in the ranking here just represents the baseline Knoll, and we'll get to a more advanced one here in a bit. The Demon Lord Yinogu is a being of slaughter and endless hunger. Once, long, long ago, he was able to assault the material plane directly, wreaking havoc wherever he wandered. In one region, a pack of hyenas followed behind Yinogu, feasting upon the carcasses that he left behind. This transformed them into the gnolls, crazed, sadistic killers and demon worshippers, about as close to being actual demons as a humanoid can get. The baseline knoll only has basic weapon attacks and a rampage feature that allows it to move and bite after it's reduced a creature to zero hit points, so it's nothing special mechanically speaking, but this entry forms a wickedly fantastic foundation to build upon. At the top of C tier, we have the Orc, which is not too different than Knolls, though slightly less on the demonic and animalistic side, and slightly higher on the actual humanoid side. Well, what could I say about Orcs that has not already been said? Such a classic monster, one of the most classic of all, tracing roots back to the works of Tolkien. Ugly, brutal, savage, fierce, intense. Orcs make for excellent enemies and villains, and, in certain rare cases, a mighty kind of anti-hero. As with the Knoll, the baseline orc warrior is not very unique, essentially just an aggressive bandit or berserker type melee warrior, though I do rather like the orc's racial feature of being able to dash towards an enemy as just a bonus action. And that brings us all the way through C tier. What a motley bunch of monsters it is. It had a lot of creatures, and many of them had some good aspects, along with some mediocre or not so good aspects. If you're someone who really enjoys when a creature has both interesting lore and interesting mechanics, consider getting yourself a copy of my book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica. It features over 170 original monsters that are bursting full of personality and adventure hooks. There's quotes and stories about them, dynamic combat abilities, and lots of unique features. 
As well, there is a lot of fantastic art from artists all over the world. Here are a few examples for you if you want to pause and take in their glory. In addition, the book also has tons of content for players, from new class options to feats and spells. The link to my website where you can purchase your copy is down in the video description. Currently, the PDF version is available, and in the near future, the hardcover version will also be out. This ranking is a big one, so I'm splitting it into two parts. The second one will be out very soon, and it's going to have even more creatures than the first one. So look out for that coming just right around the corner. There are a bunch of humanoids to go through still, and some excellent ones at that. I will see you in the next video, and may your adventures be many.